It's well known the moon is the main cause of tides on Earth. There's one tidal bulge facing the moon, and one in the opposite direction, as shown in this schematic visualization. In this video, we'll explain why this happens using a flat model of the Earth with beads attached to it. We'll simulate various situations and see what happens to the beads. Let's start with a very simple simulation. We'll put our Earth model in a uniform gravity field pulling to the right. A uniform gravity field pulls all objects with the same acceleration regardless of their mass, so all parts of the model will move together without any shape distortion. Now let's add a camera that tracks the Earth and view the same scene through it. As before, we have the gravity force pulling everything to the right, but our camera will accelerate to the right too. So to compensate for that, we need to add a fictitious force pulling everything to the left. Note that we speak about forces, but the arrows visualize the accelerations that they cause, and not the forces themselves. The two forces cancel each other out, so all parts of the model will stand still. So we've watched the same scene from two different points of view. The first is called an inertial frame of reference, and it has only real forces. The second, viewed through an accelerating camera, is called a non-inertial frame of reference. It has both real and fictitious forces. Each point of view tells a different story, but both are equally correct. We just need to make sure we add the appropriate fictitious forces in the non-inertial one. In the following, we'll continue to explain each scene using different points of view. Now, we'll repeat the same simulation, but this time with a non-uniform gravity field. It gets stronger as we move to the right. So now, each part of the model has a different acceleration. The beads on the right have the greatest acceleration. Compared with the middle part, they will rush ahead faster and stretch to the right. The beads on the left have the least acceleration. They will lag behind and stretch to the left. Let's watch it again from the camera's point of view. Non-uniform gravity as before, but the acceleration due to the fictitious force is still uniform. So this time, when we add the two forces together, they don't cancel each other out. The remainders are called tidal forces, and they'll stretch the beads sideways. Next, we'll put the Earth in orbit around the Sun. The Sun causes tidal forces too, as we're about to see. We'll give the model some initial velocity. If it weren't for the Sun's gravity, it would have flown in a straight line. But the Sun has a gravity field, and it's not uniform. It gets stronger the closer we are to the center. It will cause the Earth to fall down, but each part falls with a different acceleration, causing the same stretching phenomenon we saw before. The beads closest to the sun rushed ahead, and those furthest from the sun lagged behind, forming two bulges just like before. Notice the closer bulge is a bit larger than the other. This is because the Earth here is very close to the sun, but we'll elaborate on that later. Let's continue watching. Instead of flying in a straight line, the Earth will fall towards the sun again and again. It will stretch along the direction of the fall. And this continues. Being in orbit means an endless freefall. We're ready now to switch to a non-inertial frame of reference, but first, let's mark the acceleration due to gravity at the center of the Earth. It's called a centripetal acceleration. It's pulling towards the center, keeping the Earth in orbit. This camera tracks the Earth so it has the same acceleration. Let's dive in. We have gravity, and as before, a fictitious force. Note that this is not a centrifugal force. It's basically the same kind of fictitious force we saw before. It produces uniform acceleration opposite that of the camera. We'll see a centrifugal force later. Combining the fictitious force and gravity will again get tidal forces. Here too, we see the asymmetry, which is what we'll explain next. Let's freeze a point in time in a non-inertial orbiting view. Let's focus on this line, and mark gravity accelerations along it. The fictitious acceleration is the same everywhere, and in the middle, it exactly cancels out gravity's acceleration, 
so the tidal forces are basically the difference between each point and the middle. This is also true outside the line, except here the vector differences leave components facing inward. Back to our line again, let's now measure the gravity field at every point along it, and draw a graph of the results. Let's mark the difference between the right side and the center, and the difference between the left side and the center. The left one is somewhat bigger because of the way the graph is curving, which explains the asymmetry. This is the formula for this graph. Let's compute its first and second derivatives. The first derivative gives us the slope of the graph at a given point. The larger the slope, the larger the differences between the sides and the center, and the larger the tidal forces. The second derivative controls the curvature. The larger the curvature, the greater the asymmetry. So we have one formula for gravity, one controls the tidal forces, and one controls the asymmetry. Note that all three are proportional to the sun's mass m, so they all scale evenly when we change it. The formulas are also all inversely proportional to the distance r, but with different exponents. With each derivative, the exponent gets larger by one. The larger the exponent, the faster the decay as the distance grows. Here, gravity is weaker, but the slope has decreased even more and the curvature even more than the slope. If we'll now increase the sun's mass, we'll get strong tidal forces, but with better symmetry. We'll get even more symmetry by increasing the distance further. Let's increase the sun's mass to see it. Here's how it looks like in simulation. In real life, the sun is so far away, its tidal forces are too small to be drawn in the scale we use here, but they still have a noticeable effect for us on Earth. Everything we said is basically also true for an Earth-Moon system. The Moon's mass in this simulation is the same as the Earth. The two bodies orbit around the common center of mass, called the barycenter, now exactly in the middle. Just like before, the Earth is being pulled by the Moon's non-uniform gravity field and keeps falling down towards it, stretching as it falls. Or, from the Earth's point of view, we also have the fictitious force, and together with gravity, we get tidal forces. Let's decrease the Moon's mass. The barycenter is now closer to the Earth. Decreasing the Moon's mass further, the barycenter gets inside the Earth, but the situation is still basically the same. The Earth is still falling towards the Moon, only more slowly. Let's look closer to see it. In the non-inertial view, we see tiny tidal forces. In real life, the Moon's tidal forces are even smaller, only about double that of the Sun. Both are too weak to stretch a bead on a spring, but they cause currents that make sea level rise and fall, and even slightly distort the solid part of the Earth. So we've seen how to explain the two tidal bulges in an inertial frame and in a non-inertial frame orbiting together with the Earth. So far, the Earth wasn't rotating around its own axis, which is what we'll add next. For this, we'll need to get into rotating frames of reference, and things will get a bit more complicated. Here's our model again by itself, rotating. The beads tend to fly out in straight lines, but the springs hold them back. They stretch out until the force of the springs provides enough centripetal acceleration to keep them in orbit. Always, when we see an object orbiting, there must be some source of centripetal acceleration. Now, let's add a camera. Note that previously we had a camera that was orbiting, but not rotating. This one's rotating, which gives rise to new kinds of fictitious forces. First, we have the centrifugal force, pushing from the center of rotation outward. It stretches out the beads until it balances out with the real forces. A rotating frame of reference has another fictitious force called Coriolis. It only affects objects that move, and here everything stands still so we don't see it. Now, a model that stands still in the inertial frame so all the beads are at their baseline position. As an exercise, let's view this through a rotating camera. If we add the appropriate fictitious forces, everything should work out. As before, we have the centrifugal force. 
But now, also, the Coriolis force plays a part. When a scene is viewed through a camera that rotates counterclockwise, the Coriolis force deflects all moving objects to the right. The two forces combined provide just the right amount of centripetal acceleration. Let's get back to the Sun-Earth simulation, and now see what happens if we add some Earth rotation. As before, we'll give our model an initial velocity, but now also a spin. It's possible to explain what's happening here in the inertial frame, but it's easier to already switch to an orbiting, non-rotating camera. So we have gravity, and the simple fictitious force of the orbiting camera. After adding it, this frame of reference behaves just like an inertial frame, so we can add a rotating camera on top of it. This view inherits the two forces we had so far, that together create the familiar tidal forces. But the rotating camera adds more fictitious forces. The centrifugal force pushes all the beads from the center of the Earth outwards almost evenly. It's proportional to the distance from the center, so those already further away get a bit more. But this is a small effect. Also, since the beads slowly stretch out and back in, there's a small Coriolis force deflecting them to the right as they move. So the bottom line is that the centrifugal and Coriolis forces can distort the tidal bulges, but are not the cause of the tidal bulges. But there's a different story we can tell in which the centrifugal force is part of the cause of the tidal bulges. Let's repeat again the Sun-Earth simulation. For simplicity, the Earth will orbit without rotating, like we saw in the beginning. But this time, we'll choose a different way to view it. This camera is fixed on the Sun, rotating so its right side points at the Earth. Let's switch to this rotating view. As usual, we have non-uniform gravity. And since we're in a rotating frame of reference, also a centrifugal force, but this time the center of rotation is the Sun. The centrifugal acceleration is not uniform too, so the situation seems more complicated than before. However, we still need to end up explaining the same shape. Let's focus on one bead. This arrow marks its distance from the center of rotation. The centrifugal acceleration is proportional to this distance. We can present the distance as the sum of two parts. Similarly, the centrifugal acceleration can be presented as the sum of two parts, each proportional to the respective part of the distance. We can repeat this analysis for all the beads. Let's focus on the larger part. It's uniform and is identical to the simple fictitious force we had in the orbiting frame of reference. Together with gravity, we get the same tidal forces. The second part pushes all the beads outwards almost evenly so it's not contributing to the tidal effects. And we also have the Coriolis force, deflecting the beads to the right. Combined, they provide the required centripetal acceleration. Lastly, this view clearly shows the bulges are not perfectly aligned with the Sun. This is because the beads don't respond instantly to the tidal forces, and the Earth rotates while they do.